Hi everybody, Adam Steele here, and today is a big day for me. Dolby Atmos is technically possible in Reaper. I have found a way. It's long, it's complicated, there are caveats. You can do it with one machine, or you can do it with two machines. There are headaches, there have been stumbles, there have been roadblocks, and I've just about gotten around all of it. And today, I'm gonna show you how. Before I do, it would be criminal of me not to mention the Ultimate Reaper Guide on ProMix Academy. That's the course where I take you through from the very start to the very finish of producing something in Reaper, getting to know the software, recording a band, recording MIDI, manipulating it all using external plugins and fancy extensions and things. The link to that is down in the description below. Now I'm gonna take you over to my mix room, Studio B, which is at my house, cause that's easier. But there are two machines there. First I start with a Mac, which you need a Mac currently uh, to do the Dolby Atmos thing because the Dolby Atmos renderer pretty much only works on Mac OS right now. Typical disclaimer, Adam Steele does not condone using the Hackintosh method of using a PC as a Mac OS device. <clears throat> I I actually don't do that. And like I said, I, I don't condone it, but it's a thing that exists. Uh, but you do need something running Mac OS to run the Dolby Atmos renderer. We're on version 5.0 right now, and that currently does need Mac OS. There may be changes in the future. I'm hoping there will be. But later in the video, I also talk about a more powerful method where you use a separate mix machine and a separate Atmos machine. I've managed to make it work using Windows on the mix machine and a Mac for the Atmos machine. It would be easier to have Macs for both, but I know that can get expensive. And also, I found a way to not have to use two really expensive audio interfaces because the common way to do it right now is using Dante, which is audio over IP, which is a great format for getting digital audio from one computer to another and for live production, all sorts of clever things going on there, but it's expensive and I found a way to do it without any of that. So without further ado, let's go and get on with this very long technical video where you'll see me talking about roadblocks and stumbles as well. Let's go. Okay, so Atmos with Reaper, it's a lot. So I'm trying to break it down into three sections. I already filmed all this once and I'm doing it again as I found even more stumbling blocks and I'm trying to make this as clear as possible. So I'm gonna do it in three parts. Part number one is I'm gonna just talk about the Atmos renderer on its own and how we need to set that up. Number two is using one copy of Reaper on that same computer to get our mix through to the Dolby Atmos renderer and how we need to think about it with beds and objects. And then part three is shifting the mix to a second computer, one that's kind of more powerful and can do the mixing side of things and how to then get that audio from the other machine into the rendering computer. So without further ado, Let's start from the start. This is my Mac. And like I may have said at the start, you need a Mac. Uh, this is a MacBook Air M2, so it's really quite new. And this is pretty much how the Atmos renderer comes when you just open it up, turn it on and press go. So let's talk you through some of what we see on screen because that will help us then when we get to the Reaper side of things to be able to put the two together effectively. Firstly, let's look at this big kind of field of colors here. So this is all the things that are coming in to the renderer. We need to kind of think about this in two parts. What's coming into the renderer and what's going out. And what's going out is what we're going to hear. Now I have changed something here, so I'm going to change it back in the preferences. We're going to go to 
Dolby Atmos renderer and preferences. And in the preferences, there are a lot of things we're going to look at, but first at the bottom, the outputs. So by default, we've got speaker outputs and headphone outputs. And I'm just going to hit OK. And you'll see a whole load of faders here now. Meters, in fact, not faders. So by default, this is assuming that I have 12 speakers in this room. 7.1.4. That is to say, seven speakers around me, one subwoofer, and four up above in a height configuration. Two in front of me, two behind me. Then we have headphones where it says bin, bin meaning binaural, which is how I'm actually going to be monitoring this because uh, one of the ways that a lot of people are going to hear the output of Atmos is through headphones or through speakers even using the binaural processing. That is to say, taking the 3D objects and 3D everything and making it appear 3D with only needing a pair of cans. Now, if you've got 12 speakers, 14 speakers, however many speakers you've got, you can change that if we go to setup at the top and room setup. You can tell it how many speakers you have. If you don't have height speakers, you can unclick them. Suddenly we're at 7.1. If I unclick the back ones, now I'm at 5.1. So if you have 5.1, you could mix Atmos in 5.1. You might not get quite the full effect. Um, of, of monitoring for the height and the, the rear speakers. But if that's what you have, you can do this. So I'm going to turn these all back on and just assume that's correct. Under routing, you then define what channel numbers everything is going out from. Yeah, so that, that's the standard. One, one and two is left and right, and then it goes center and sub. And then we get each pair as we go back and we go up and down. If some speakers need a little bit of a delay, you can do that. Let's say that something is a little closer than it should be. You can add a tiny little bit of delay on there if need be. And monitoring, you have different layouts, uh, which you can define uh, nice and quickly. So you can then flick between those types for monitoring without having to come into this setup. And then in headphones, you're defining where the outputs are. Currently, they're set to 127, 128, which is... Uh, way beyond anything that I have plugged in here. I'm using an Audience ID44 for all my outputs, which I would have to use the optical outputs to get 12 outputs from, but that's entirely possible. But if I hit accept, I can go back to my preferences and what I'm going to do is at the bottom have headphone only mode turned on. So headphone only mode changes the headphones to be one and two, which is much more easy for most interfaces to deal with. And in my case, the output device is this Audience ID44. I've also used external headphones or even the MacBook speakers to just make sure sound is working, but any, any interface you have would come there and hit accept and off we go. And that's removed a lot of these meters because now there's only the binaural output. The way you have to think about Atmos is input things, whether it's a bed or an object, the middle, which is the Atmos file type, and then the output is the what we're using to hear it, which is separate. That's how Atmos is so flexible, but it does come at a cost. Now, with all of these on the left, let's talk about the inputs now. The ones in purple are what you would call a bed. A bed being a simple channels like you would get in classic surround sound, like classic 5.1, you would be given five channels of audio and a sub. Uh, with this, the highest it will go currently is 7.1.2 as a bed track, which is to say seven speakers around you, uh, one subwoofer and two speakers higher up in front of you. It's really annoying that you can't do 7.1.4 considering that Atmos can go out at that. But that's a complaint for another day. Maybe they'll update the renderer at some point. I hope they do. And then these ones that are all in yellow are objects. And an object you've got to think of a little bit differently. You've got to think of it like you're in a game. Let's say you're in a game, you're in a first person shooter and you're kind of facing forwards and you hear a kind of a roar kind of sound from behind you. In the game, 
that's a bad guy. And the bad guy's sound comes from an object. And that object is where that bad guy is. So that as you turn your play around, the object technically stays in the same place and it's you that moves. And so that's how objects would work, except that in this case, it's not supposed to be you that moves. You can automate the object moving, like if the bad guy decided to run bit from behind you to in front of you. That's kind of how you should think about objects. That way you can have them in different places at different times. And the reason there's 128 of them available to you is if you're working on a film, you might want different things to happen at different parts in the same scene. Yeah, it could be anything. In in music, I think 128 is kind of overkill. But the option is there. The downside, if we look at the bottom, is it says CPU 30%. And that's quite a lot of percentage for this to be using before anything even happens. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn down the number of channels. So I'm going to go to input and input configuration. And so here we get our first 10 channels are defined as that 7.1.2. And then we have objects and that goes all the way down to 128. So what I'm going to do is I want 32 in total. It's a nice round number. And so I'm going to click on 33. Shift click to the last one and change these to be nothing. And then when I hit accept, we'll see that a lot of these channels then are no longer lit up. And the CPU usage has gone from 30% to 13%, which is way less. And especially when we start running things like Reaper and running mixes on the same machine, that is going to free up a lot of kind of space, a lot of CPU space for us to do more complex things without maxing out the system. Now let's talk about a few more of these things on screen because there is a lot to cover. Where it says output, that is a giant volume fader for your speakers and headphones. Uh, if your interface already has one of those volume controls that can handle all 12 speakers or whatever it is, feel free to use that instead. This output does not affect the Atmos file. This just affects the monitoring. This just affects what you hear. So. As an example, if I had this down at minus 20 because my speakers had quite like loud amplifiers, that wouldn't mean that when I uh, save the master file that then there is a uh, you know, 20 dB drop compared to everybody else. That's not how this works. That is just for what we're hearing. Now, the source input and master, that's to do with this essentially being a playback device. Um, when we've recorded our song, or a piece of whatever it is into the Atmos renderer, it then switches to master. So when we hit play, we'll then hear back what we've been sending to the renderer. Kind of like a tape machine playback, uh, as opposed to the input mode, which is just input monitoring and is gonna pass through what it's being given by Pro Tools Logic, Reaper, whatever, but then live uh, kind of down or up mixing it as needed, as defined in the middle. The next number is the time in time code, which we, we need our door to be sending time code to the renderer so that as the objects move, the data gets sent at the right time so that the door, whether it's Reaper or Flip Pro Tools logic says at three seconds, or three and a half seconds, this object is going to start moving this way. This object is going to start moving that way etc 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 that all needs to be lined up and it's going to be sent as 24 frame per second time code not 23.976 um it is 24.0 frames per second it's worth knowing so that everything lines up right uh, the button next to that that should be highlighted that now means that if a door sends time code to the dolby atmos renderer it will automatically follow it this is important if we're playing a master back, we're probably going to want to untick that because then the stop and play buttons work and they are completely independent then. So we can stop and play the track and just listen back to it without it being hooked up to the other system. And record of course is what it means. Once you've got your mix ready on your door, 
then you hit record here and you hit play in your door and it transfers it all in and saves it as uh, a wave file with metadata as a dot atmos file now record in and out i found quite useful because it, with the whole time code thing that can take half a second or a full second to lock together between the door and the renderer so what i like to do is leave a few seconds of silence at the start of a project i've always done that gives me a little safety because then if i've got anything fancy going on there is that time for everything to lock together and work properly and so you can use the in and the out so when you hit the record button it doesn't record anything in outside of those parameters so you can define okay my song's gonna start here it's gonna end here so if you decide to go off and get yourself a drink and it finishes uh, the, the song, then it will automatically stop the, the recording, which means that then when it comes to exporting that, you've got a much more clean kind of setup. A few more things to talk about before we move on to Reaper. Uh, speaker calibration. Of course, in headphone only mode, that's not going to work, but that's kind of like a sonar worksy kind of thing where you can EQ things and set things up as needed. Uh, which again doesn't affect the uh, the Atmos file, only affects uh, what you're hearing, which can be quite useful. Binaural render mode is quite important. I currently have everything set to be mid uh, for the binaural mode, but what you can change is you can change uh, whether objects are closer, further away, perceptually in binaural mode which may affect the exports depending on how you want it all uh, to come across. I've kept it all on the default of mid, but if I find later that any objects or even the bed feel too close or feel too far away, I can adjust this as necessary and see how it feels. And in the preferences, uh, our input is going to be Dolby Audio Bridge if we're using a door on the same machine, which is what we're going to do first. If we're using a different machine to send audio over, the audio input device is what has to be changed. We can define that later. The LTC input channel is time code, wh what channel that's coming in on. Um, if we're using an interface that say doesn't have 130 channels, we can define this. Usually the last channel or next to last channel is kind of reserved for that so that you don't have to hear it. Uh, the frame rate is set to 24 frames a second. It does say you can change it in here, but the Dolby Atmos documentation pretty much demands that it be exactly 24 frames a second. So if you can do that, then you should do that. Otherwise it might make life difficult. And also it can do 96 kilohertz, but a lot of the features don't seem to work at this current time, which means that you're basically forced to use 48K. And so that's what I would recommend for now. A headphone renderer mode, I'm keeping that on binaural. There is output limiting as well, which hopefully we're not going to go near the limiter, but the option is there. We're not supposed to be limiting tracks in Atmos. There's really no benefit to that because the definition is they want the average of the song to be at minus 18 dB uh, LUFS. Uh, I think that's a measurement, but it's yeah, integrated, uh, short term, all that kind of stuff. They have certain specific levels they want you to be at and if you're not at that then they will correct you so limiting uh, yourself using a separate limiter is not really going to be beneficial to you so with all that in mind what i'm going to do is go to file and create a new master file and i'm just going to call this atmos test reaper one and hit create and that has everything now set with the correct beds the correct objects uh, the input is now set to sync. Everything is ready and we can go ahead and open Reaper. Now, the first two things we need to set up in Reaper before we do anything. Firstly, we need to set up because it's on the same computer, the audio device to be the Dolby Audio Bridge. We need it to be 48,000, 48K. And we can hit apply and that will now not try and use an external interface from Reaper. It will now send the audio straight through to the Dolby renderer, which then by proxy will send the processed audio out through the interface I've got plugged in down by my feet, uh, which then 
feeds the headphones and also the way I have it routed means that you can hear what we're doing too. Um, I highly recommend if you're listening along to what we're doing today, wear headphones. You can do this on monitors or whatever, but it will sound extremely strange using a binaural playback through monitors. It's not going to sound quite right. Uh, the, the binaural system is the best way if you only have a two channel system to try and hear the 3D stuff happening. But yeah, otherwise just don't. <laughs> the other thing that we need to change is in the audio tab here, we need to untick the top option, which is close audio device when stopped and application is inactive. We basically, we need Reaper to be carrying on doing its thing when it's not the active program, the active app, because now we're going to be looking at the Atmos renderer a lot. Um, usually that's a useful feature. So if you flick to kind of, you know, writing something in Chrome or pages or whatever it is that you use, your battery won't fly down. Your CPU won't be absolutely clogged because you're not currently working in Reaper. But today for this, we specifically need this to be unticked so that this system will carry on uh, doing the thing in the background, which is what we need. So we hit OK. And now we have a nice blank project. So usually the way that we would do things in Reaper is we would have our audio come in on a track. So I'm going to quickly just drop in an audio file of some kind. So I've dropped in and turned down uh, the, the theme tune. It's you, you already heard it at the, the start of the, the, sh the show, but it's just a something to illustrate the point. Usually this is routed out through the master and the master is stereo. The way that I'm going to set up my Atmos project is not using the master at all. Quickly going to save this project as something. Atmos single computer test. Okay. So the first thing that I want to do is just shift and click on the master output there just to make sure it doesn't go out anywhere. That's now red, which means nothing's going to happen. But then also, if I have this and I untick master send, I clicked on the routing button there. This is Reaper 6. Untick that. And now I could add hardware outputs one and two on this track. And if I hit play, we should hear something. We can hear it all sounds a little bit kind of echoey, a bit reverby. If I go into the renderer with that playing. You can see that channels one and two are lit up yellow. They, they're, they're kind of volume based. They go green when there's sound, yellow when there's lots of sound, red when there's a clip. You don't ever want to see red in the Atmos renderer uh, because the clipping that you will get in there is not the pleasant kind of clipping. Uh, this is not really uh, a format where clipping will be a big benefit to you. Now, depending on how you want to mix your bed, in Atmos, you might want every channel of yours to go to all of the 7.1.2 channels. Or you might want to have things in a folder or like a bus and then pan the bus. Either method is perfectly valid. And if you were to do the kind of the bus mixing thing, like let's say the rhythm guitars were a stereo bus, you can work that entire bus in stereo as you used to traditionally. And then at the end, put the, the plugin on, which is going to do the thing. So what we're going to do is do the thing by changing this to be uh, resurround pan. Now resurround pan will go after any other processing that you have on this track. So this is let's say this was a drum bus or something and we've mixed the stereo drums as we like. You also have the separate option if you wanted to mix each part of the drums separately, but that's entirely up to you. So you could pan them to different places up to you. But let's just say this is a group that you want to make surround. 
there are three different ways to see where this is because this shows you in a 3D space and this one, my favorite, shows you kind of as a cube. Now, the input channels here is two because this is a stereo track going in and the output is currently stereo because that's default, but I can change that and I'm going to change that to 7.1.2 surround. There is also 7.1.2 ITU, but I'm not entirely comfortable with the ITU stuff. So now that I've done that, I can click on that cube and move this around, but you'll see white and red here. And the white and red are the two channels. So what I can do is if I change edit selected to edit all, that will grab the left and the right input sources. And then where it says left, right, rear, front, low, high, I can move these controls so that I'm changing the width there with left and right. I'm changing rear front with that slider. So I'm bringing it further back or further forward. And then low high is moving this up and down. So I've now moved this up a little bit, back a little bit. And if I hit play on this, we should see a lot more go on, except we won't. And I'll tell you why in a second. So we could see lots of meters going in resurround pan, but we didn't see very much coming through in the Dolby renderer. And that's because this track in Reaper is still outputting only two channels and we need it to output 10 channels now because we've got 7, 8, 9, 10, 7, point one, point two. There we go. Use hands properly, Adam. Yes. So 7.1.2. So what we need to do, this plugin says it's now two in, 10 out, but we need to change our hardware output here. This is one of the sends that we can see in the mix window back here. And if I click on that, it will say one and two to output one and two. What I need to do is drop this down because I can now make this a multi-channel source, 10 channels, and send that to one to 10. Now, the way that the Dolby Audio Bridge works is it's sending 130 channels out. But if we look at the renderer, channels one to 10 are that bed. That's why we just said then go out to channels one and 10. And so everything that we wanted to be part of the bed, like, you know, guitars, drums, bass, whatever, would all go out of outputs one and one to 10. Now, if I hit play here, That feels a lot louder, but it also feels really quite in your face. And that's because I brought these uh, further forward and higher up. So they're now virtually, of course, but coming out of all the different things. Ah, having just done a little bit of uh, extra research, uh, just so you guys know as well, 7.1.2 I had made the assumption that the point two were at the front, but they're not. They're supposed to be directly overhead, uh, left and right. So they are central, which makes sense now as to why when I lift uh, the audio up, it gets louder because no matter where, then it's coming out more from the top. So the nine and 10 in the renderer are implying the height of the bed, which makes more sense uh, now. So I suppose it's the objects then that would define uh, front and back with height. Whereas it's so if you've got a point four output, then the point two height would just be kind of duplicated a little bit lower level. In theory, uh, whether that's the case in practice, I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, that's getting a little bit uh, overly complicated. What we could do now is save this track format and this plugin, just copy this plugin across. So if I had, so let's say I was, that was the drum group and I wanted to make a bass group. The first thing I would do is make a new track, copy across the resurround pan because that will automatically change this channel to be a 10 track channel. And then open the routing, untick master send channel and 
do hardware output, let's just say one and two, and then change that to be multi-channel source, 10 channels, one to 10. And that's now got the same panning information as the other track did. And it's got the correct number of outputs that that would then go through to the bed channel in the renderer as well. And much like in a stereo mix, when you pile everything on top, it all combines together volume wise, same deal as far as the bed is concerned. So it's not just about how loud each element is, it's how loud everything is combined together. Classic mixing principles. Another couple of things to quickly note before I move on to talking about objects is you can change in this drop down here LFE so you can define some of this element going to the subwoofer if you so desire. Uh, you are encouraged not to use the sub uh, for things like band stuff. It's usually supposed to be reserved for effects. Uh, the assumption being that your uh, satellite speakers are capable of reproducing low frequency content that a band would make and not the kind of Godzilla type stuff. Uh, I like to still add a little bit in myself, but that's personal preference thing. Do not go crazy with it because then you've got the headroom to add things like big booming subs and that kind of thing. I mean, unless your song has a ridiculously kind of sub thing in, in which case that element probably should go to the LFE. And then there's divergence, which is to do with how kind of diffuse each sound is, whether they're coming from a specific point or whether they would be virtually at least coming a bit out of this speaker, a bit out of that speaker, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we are highly encouraged by a lot of the uh, record labels, the major labels, not to use the center channel specifically unless there is some real uh, need for a specific thing. Um, so it should be what's called a phantom center. That's, that's what's encouraged anyway. If a little bit of noise comes out the center, that's okay. Uh, but it shouldn't be like in a film where the vocals tend to come out of the center speaker um, because that can cause weird issues with some listening devices, some playback devices like phones and tablets and that kind of stuff where depending on how they choose to interpret uh, the audio, you might find that the vocal in a song completely either gets lost or is really overbearingly loud and isn't in the balance that you defined it to be. So you're better off making it left and right, and then balancing it that way. Apparently, at the time of filming this video. Now, let's talk about objects. I'm gonna close these two things down, and I'm going to make a new track, and I'm going to call this, ah, zoom, zoom. So, what I want to do, I've got all these yellow things here, which means there's no data connected to those yet. And so I'm going to take the first couple of channels that are available to me, which in this case is 11 and 12, and I'm going to get a thing and I'm going to move it around. Again, you don't have to move stuff around. You can keep them static if you so desire. Um, don't go crazy with it because, you know, it, people will get tired really fast. But the way to do this is a couple of uh, steps. So firstly, I've made a new track. And again, we need to untick master send. And we need to send this out of hardware outputs. And again, this is track 11 and 12. So this is going out of output 11 and 12. I hope you're with me so far. So the object now, if I put a sound in here, uh, this is one of the YouTube songs from JHS. Uh, thank you, JHS. This is really useful to have stuff like this. I'm going to make it a lot less loud because that's way loud for what we're doing today. Uh, this is now going to come out of 11 and 12 and we'll see it in the renderer, but we don't hear it, not least because it's not been told where it should be coming from. So now we need to add in the panner. So I'm going to type in P-A-N and out, there are two choices in Reaper. There's the VST3 panner and the AU panner. Make sure you use the AU panner because I've found that the VST3 panner uh, when you try and automate the movement, it doesn't go through properly to the Atmos renderer program. Whereas uh, the AU version seems to work as expected. So at the top here, there's object pair, which I'm going to define as 11 and 12. So now if I hit play, 
we should see this come up in the Atmos render and hear it. So we can hear it. Uh, there is the next issue, which is if I move them around, you'll see them uh, move in uh, the renderer. You see those little uh, yellow dots there in the renderer? Those are our items, our objects that have been moved to the back. So far, so good. But there is no synchronization yet between the uh, renderer and Reaper. So what we need to do is now send the uh, timecode out through Reaper to Atmos so that we can then get things rocking and rolling so everything stays together. So that when we send movement information from Reaper, the Atmos renderer picks it up lockstep and does things as expected. Now, there are two ways of doing this. Well, first things first, let's go to project settings in Reaper and change our frame rate, which is under video, to 24 and hit OK. Now, there are two ways to add timecode in here, and I'm just going to use the Dolby one for now. So I've made a new track and I'm just going to call it time code. You don't have to call it this, but it means I know what it is. And the first thing I'm going to do is untick master send channels because you don't want to hear time code uh, coming through your speakers. It sounds awful. It's the worst thing. Uh, my poor friend, Mike Mallion once got a blast of time code in his ears and I saw him almost burst into tears. So don't do that. And hardware outputs at the bottom here. I'm going to just zoom that right to the bottom. And we saw in the Atmos renderers preferences that it said LTC audio 129. So we're going to set our output here from Reaper on 129. If you're using uh, an interface, which we'll come back to this later with the two computer thing, but if you're using an interface that doesn't have 130 outputs, you can define another one as long as both the, the DAW and the renderer know, you know the same channel. So now anything that we do on that timecode channel will come out of output 129. So I'm just going to type in my plugins and add a plugin, Dolby Atmos LTC generator. That's the one. So the LTC generator, again, locked to 24 FPS. If I hit play, in Reaper now, we should now see with the clock icon, yeah, turned on in the renderer, this should now go together. So there you will have seen me uh, playing around with the uh, X, Y, and Z controls. And yeah, you could see there that everything was uh, not quite uh, yeah, showing up in the renderer, but we could hear it doing what it was supposed to do. So we've got X, we've got Y. You can separate the objects out if you want them to be mono. There is also a sequencer if you need things to go step, 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 step. I'm not sure why you would, but it's a nice option to have. And the size seemed to increase the volume, but also uh, redefined these as not just point sources, but as something that was spread across a larger area, which could be really useful for kind of if you've got a single point source effect 
and you want it to be larger than a point and just kind of washing over the listener, that's the, the nicest way to do that. So from here, in theory, this is all you need to mix in Atmos from one machine. At this point, what I could do is if this was my mix, I mean, it'd be a pretty terrible mix, but if this was my mix, um, I could then hit record in the uh, renderer. And then when I'm ready, I hit play in Reaper and watch. And yes, there's a bit of silence here, but if we leave this going a second, we should get the objects coming up now. And we can see the green. Now you should automate things here, but let's move this myself. Now I hit, there we go. Now I hit stop. That has also stopped in Atmos and that has changed from input to master. Now quickly, I should mention that when I was moving the objects there, which of course you can do in real time, uh, what's probably more efficient to do is go into the, uh, the uh, automation of the uh, item and in the plugin list here, which is the same as any other automation in Reaper, I might tick pan X, Y, Z and object size. And now those will show up as lanes that I can then tweak and move and automate as needed. I don't need to show all of these. Let's say that I just had uh, an object that was going back to front. I could just show the Y panner and then I could draw in my uh, line here and then that would move as and we're not hearing that because we changed from input to master if i change back to input you can see how that's being automated into movement but yes on master mode it's still tied to the time code coming from reaper so if we tick the blue tick box that unties it and then we can hit play from the start and listen back to what we have. And of course the audio jumps in there because we started the audio in Reaper not at zero. So any data before that in Reaper as far as the Atmos renderer is concerned doesn't exist. Keep that in mind. It's the same as like, you know, transferring to Melodyne. It's the same as transferring over analog. It's the same as transferring old school, basically. Um, if it's done in real time, it's done from the very beginning to the very end. And there is a separate uh, Atmos mastering program, which can be used to trim starts and ends. Uh, the Atmos renderer costs $300, you know, 300 pounds tax, all that kind of stuff. The mastering extra bit, I think, is an extra 80. Uh, so, yeah, as much as it's, yeah, it's always more money. It's, uh, yeah, it's not a huge amount more money, but that's the thing you would need if you were doing mastering for final output. So that's if you're doing that. Right? Hey, so that was a single computer, and this computer is keeping up just. But what if... Uh, you want to do a full complicated mix with hundreds of plugins, lots of automation. You've already done all that work and you know that your Mac that you want to do the Atmos on simply wouldn't be able to handle that. Now, you can use two machines. Where we were using the Dolby Audio Bridge between Reaper and Atmos before, you cannot use that. You can choose to have 
uh, the audio from a separate computer going out over a network via Dante, uh, over cables using MADI. Um, the, there are other solutions too. Uh, they are really expensive. And so uh, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to find a different method. Now, if I was using two Macs, this might have been a tiny little bit easier as well, because if you're using two Macs, the Panner plugin is supported on Mac, as you've I've seen. Uh, and the Panner plugin can send its data over a network, over a LAN connection. I have two computers here, both connected by Ethernet cables, hardwired LAN which if you're going to use two computers, I very much recommend doing. Don't, don't use Wi-Fi because Wi-Fi is not stable enough to send this amount of audio continuously and safely. Uh, but the way that it's done in most big studios right now is computer number one has a big interface that either has Dante or Maddy or equivalent, a second interface that connects to the second machine that has Dante or Maddy or whatever, and you connect the two and then you define computer one goes out this one, computer two comes in. And it's expensive and it seems really silly to me because it's digital audio. It's not going to change bit for bit. If I can send digital audio over a network, it is going to be perfect and pristine. So I started doing some investigations. My first port of call was Dante, uh, but using virtual Dante, because this is something I'd heard about, that you could have a 64 channel virtual sound card on your computer. And I thought, hey, if that's a thing, then I could have a virtual Dante on machine number one, virtual Dante on machine number two, and send 64 channels of audio over a network. That would be more than enough, more than enough for me. And so I did some digging. I bought Dante Virtual Sound Card. Uh, doing my research, they suggested that I might need Dante Via as well, which is a separate thing. So I bought them both as a, as a pack and had tons of problems uh, because uh, the Virtual Sound Card doesn't work on its own. Uh, it turns out that the way that uh, Dante works, a hardware Dante box of some kind on the network is like the master clock kind of like in a MADI or an ADAT system or something like that, uh, one of them would run as a master clock and the Dante virtual sound card couldn't do that. But the Dante, Dante Via could do that, but that only supported 16 channels. I thought, okay, right, well, let's give that a try anyway. And I couldn't get the Dante stuff working on the Mac then. I, I got the virtual sound card up and running on here, but then I was doing some more research and I found Ravenna. Ravenna is not identical to Dante, but they can be made to be intercompatible. Um, it's a bit of a pain in the backside, but apparently it can be done. But no matter what I did, and there used to be, used to be, a free uh, virtual audio sound card for Ravenna um, for Mac, only for Mac. Uh, but uh, now they're part of merging technologies. And so, and so here I am looking at this going, oh, the, the, uh, virtual audio device Ravenna is Dolby Atmos renderer version five compliant. And so it's 49 Swiss francs, which is about 50 pounds, you know, 50, $60, $70. And so, so far I've spent a hundred dollars on the Dante and 50, $60 on this. I could not get any of it to work for love nor money. And that was, you know, that had to be uh, 64 IO, uh, whereas the premium version has 128. But if I can't send 128 from the other machine, it's, it's no, no use to me. Uh, anyway, I, th I thought I would try and get it to work and it really wouldn't because like for Dante, I also needed to download a Dante controller. Uh, for Ravenna, I needed to download their slightly broken uh, management software. Uh, which I think was called Animan, and uh, nothing I could do would get any of it to work. And so I tried to get some extra stuff from the downloads on the Ravenna website, and 
I think, yeah, Rav to Sap, I think was the thing I wanted, which converts Dante signals up to Ravenna signals or however it works. And they got back to me with trying to download that with, oh, you need to be a member. Please wait up to two business days for us to approve your login, even though it's free. And I'm like, guys, it's 2023. What is this? So I gave up and I went looking for a different solution. And the different solution that I came up with was based in, would you believe, Reaper. Reaper has so many really powerful tools. And one of the most powerful tools that I use all the time, and I probably should have started with this, is one called Restream. And I use Restream all the time. I'm going to bring it back up on here. I use Restream all the time. Uh, to send audio from whatever mix I'm doing over to OBS uh, in my monitoring effects. There we are, Restream. I use Restream on the same computer to send two channels of audio over to OBS. And that way it doesn't rely on any interface that I'm using. It doesn't have to use the same sample rate. It's very independent and it's been rock solid and it's never let me down. And in the studio, I use it with an IP address uh, and send it over to a separate streaming computer locally as a two channel thing. And that's also been rock solid. So I thought, okay, this can do up to eight outputs. I wonder if I can use a whole bunch of these to send a whole bunch of signals out. And so that is what I did and it worked. So what I needed to do was I had two copies of Reaper open. One, this is the mix machine. So this is the one that's got my iLock and my kind of plug-in alliance dongle and everything uh, plugged into. So this is the one where I would do the, the bulk of the processing. And so I made a file. And this file has an extra thing going on that isn't really relevant, but I made this whole thing and I will talk you through it bit by bit. And I also made a corresponding uh, project, which is to be opened on the Mac. And so this is the Mac. This will run in the background on the Mac. And so that with this, uh, this lot, this green stuff, uh, this is a track template that can be dropped into any currently existing Reaper project. And then you reconfigure the project for Atmos setup, but this does the bulk of the work, including an extra bonus, which I will talk about very, very quickly. So I'm using Restream and the kind of the, the biggest bit to describe is this big fat channel here that says to renderer, because that's just descriptive so that you know what to do. Uh, by the way, if you are a member of Pro Mix Academy, uh, or if you are a member of the Produce Like a Pro Academy, get in contact and we should be able to supply you with these files through the Academy, uh, because that's kind of what I'm doing this for. I'm doing this for Pro Mix Academy uh, as a big part of talking about the Ultimate Reaper Guide. And so, yeah, getting back here, you can recreate this yourself, by the way, but if you need to save yourself time, then yeah, you'll be able to download my track templates there to drop in on your two machines. So for now, let's keep it simple that the, um, all my audio on the mix machine is going in to here. It's going to renderer. So before let's say an object was going out of hardware 11 and 12. Now, instead, if I make a new track and call this object. This one will go not out of the master send as we did before, but instead the send will go to, to renderer and the audio one and two from this channel will go to 11 and 12 on to renderer. And so we repeat that with everything that we want to be an object. And then we would put in our Atmos panner here. But with this being a Windows machine, I'll come back to that in a minute. If this was a Mac, you would put your panner in here, tell it, oh, my renderer is on the network. This is the computer it is. 
this is track 11 and 12, off we go. No such luck with PCs. But anyway, that's getting off track for a minute. Uh, let's just delete that object. And let's just say this was a drum bus and I wanted this to go to the bed. I have a copy of resurround pan that should be 7.1.2 surround and should be at the front, there we go. So I'm taking a copy of the resurround pan that's on the send bed tracks here and that should automatically make this 10 channels and that way these 10 channels i can then have this wherever i need it to be make it go a little higher bring it a little further back for example and add some audio on here i'm just gonna move that over so now i have some audio And I'm hearing that through the master. I'm sure I unticked that, but apparently I didn't. And so, yeah, I shouldn't be hearing that at all. And I need to send this over to send bed tracks here. Audio multi-channel source, 10 channels, one to 10. So we're treating the send bed tracks here that I've made as our bed output, because what that's doing now it's doing an extra bonus thing, which you can kind of ignore this just for now. And then it's coming through to rear stream, which is sending, and I've called this Atmos one, and it's sending over an IP address. And that IP address is my Mac. If I go over to the Mac, this should have stream one. There we go, receive audio, Atmos one. And the IP address is the IP address of the Mac. So if I hit play on the PC, we should see something. There we go. I had to make sure that the Mac's IP address matched what it did before. Uh, so I forced that. But if your IP address of your Mac with the renderer is different than what it was before, then you need to make sure those match between the uh, kind of mix machine and the Atmos renderer machine. By me going into my uh, LAN details and forcing this, now, now I've kind of forced all the setup that was in uh, Reaper and or everything to, to not need to change. So, so what that means is the first eight channels, because I've set this to be eight in, eight out, and set audio channels eight, the first odd eight audio channels that are sent to this big track on the Windows machine, which is you know, the mix machine, the first eight channels uh, that is being sent to two renderer are going out of eight channels and then being picked up. So what I did is I thought, hey, if I can do that, I can do more and more and more. And so these all need unique names. Atmos 1, Atmos 2, Atmos 3, Atmos 4 is what I've called them. All going to the same IP address, all sending eight channels. but where we go to the 18, eight out, I have changed them. So the second one sends channel nine to 16. The third one sends channel 17 to 24. And the last one sends channels 25 to 32. And this track has, if we look in its properties, 32 channels. It could have up to 64 channels. So I could have doubled this and done it all over a, a second time. Um, I didn't want to overload the network and I didn't want to make extra CPU work when I don't think I'm going to use more than that. But if it gets to a point where I do need that, I could expand this all out to 64 channels and even make a second one of these tracks to make it up to 128. It's possible if the network can handle it, if the CPUs can handle it, if there's no dropouts over the network, it could be done. But now as I hit play, you'll see meters go because this is going across 10 channels, of course, from 7.1.2. There are 10 channels coming out from this drum bus right here, going to send bed tracks here. Then there's this thing that I'll tell you about. The, the resurround pan that's on that send bed tracks here is disabled, it's bypassed because we don't want that right now. We want our individual 
channels like the drum bus, guitar bus, whatever it is, to have their own resurround pan on so they can be in different places. So they can be, you know, panned appropriately. But that means that as, yeah, if I bring this to the rear, there we go. And the, the left front and the, the front and the rear channels will make different amounts of noise as I move them around. And so that's going well so far. And we'll see on the Mac, we can see things coming in. The, the next issue that I had was syncing up objects. This was where it be became a little bit confusing. The next thing that I did is I got time code. So I got another copy of Restream and put Atmos TC as the name, just Atmos time code. Uh, sending to the same IP address. And what I had to do here, you'll see this big strip. This is the other way to make time code. We used the Dolby plugin uh, earlier, but the other way that I didn't talk about, but I'll talk about now is to get Reaper to do it itself. So the project settings for this say that this is also 24 frames a second, but let's just delete this out and do this again. So I've got a time code channel here. If I go to insert, I'm going to go back to the zero of the, the project because that's easier and close some of this down so you can see. And I'm going to go to insert SMPTE LTC MTC MIDI timecode generator. And that's put it in my time selection. Amazing. So I'm just going to drag that out. Uh, let's say it's an hour long, but I could make it as long as I want to be. And I need to go right click and source properties on this. And that's come up on the other screens. Here it is. And by default, the frame rate is 30 and it's sending audio time code. I need it to be 24.00 and sending audio time code. So now when I hit play, you can see on the LTC, it's sending out that constant scream of, of that's what the time code is. And so that's being sent. Uh, over the IP address at the same time as the rest of the audio. And if we look back at the Mac, there we go. We can see that the time code is coming in, which means that if we go to input mode on our Dolby renderer, we should now see if we go to input mode. There we go. We can see through the input and the time code lock, the time code was moving, the audio was coming in. So we're getting closer. Our time code is locked. Our audio is going, but now we get onto another problem because my main mix machine is a Windows machine. And currently Windows machines don't have the Dolby Panner available to them, at least not to my knowledge. The renderer is available on here. Oh, but that doesn't seem to work properly and the panner doesn't work, which makes it kind of useless. So we're back to method number two, which is what we've just been doing. Uh, but what we need is, yeah, the Atmos panner doesn't work. So what I've had to do is have my objects, like let's, let's make an object on here. Let's call this object 11, 12 and do what we did, which is take away the master send and add the to render send to 11.12. Now let's just select that and loop it. And turn it way down, thank you. And then have that without any defined panning and then on the Mac. where we can see there's already a, a pre setup object with an Atmos panner, because I already did that. By default, that's over here. And now if I move this around, that should, that loop will start again in a second. Ah. 
there's the issue I was talking about before. There's the issue I was talking about with it being uh, VST3 panners that don't do the thing. So I'm quickly going to replace every one of my panners with the AU version. There we go. All those are now replaced. Save, 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 save uh, with the AU versions of the panners. So if I hit play again on the Windows machine. I had made an error, which is worth noting that when I made my time code, it was off and there was a little dip here. If I make sure that that starts exactly at zero, then I should in theory, there we go, have my uh, time code lock because my time code, I had shifted it accidentally in the Windows Reaper by a minute, which meant that the time code coming into the Atmos renderer was out by a minute. So all the panning, wasn't coming through at the correct time. Ah. So now, in theory at least, if I pan something and hit play. There we go. Right, so the issue may not have been the VST3 after all. It may have been that my timecode was coming in out of sync, which is entirely my fault, but it's something that's worth noting if you're using the timecode LTC generator in the Windows or Mac version of Reaper. If it doesn't start at zero, it will be offset. Right, so there we go. Now I can have as many objects as I like in the Atmos renderer. Uh, the music panner... This now I can, the, the one thing that was missing that wouldn't work properly because even though the time code is being sent from the mix machine to the Reaper on the other side, the Reaper on the other side could take the time code audio, but it couldn't by default make its own timeline follow that uh, because it was being treated as an audio uh, kind of source because it was then being sent out to the Atmos renderer. So I couldn't just set Reaper to uh, that as an input because it was coming over Restream. It was kind of a hack to begin with. So we needed yet another hack. <laughs> now, what I tried to do was have another Restream with a MIDI time code, uh, but that just crashed the whole system. So I ended up finding a different workaround, which had a few steps. So back on the main computer, I used a thing called OSC. OSC is awesome because OSC is kind of like MIDI, but way more advanced than it could be told exactly what to do. So under my preferences, under control OSC web, I made a new OSC object called TC locate. And there is a Reaper forum article, which I will link down below, where somebody has done this before. And so they've created an OSC template, which you use on both computers, and uh, a script for a thing called OSCIBot. And OSCIBot is made by the same people that make Reaper. So I called it TC Locate and said send locally to 9000 port and so that is sending this pattern called tc that was in that forum post so that's now sending time code over osc but there was an issue with that if i go to the preferences of the mac one let's just go back to the settings yeah to osc there's the matching receive OSC locate, which is on TC local receive on its own IP address. Um, that was causing loads of dropouts because the machine was being flooded with MIDI time code and constantly trying to readjust and re kind of shift itself around. So what I found through this article that is linked below was a thing called OSCIBot and OSCIBot back on this main computer, 
um, runs in the background. So I had to have this running. And so the script that I downloaded, I opened the script and changed the input to be local. So the time code isn't actually going to the other computer. It's going from Reaper into OSCIBot. And it's been given a script, uh, which again, uh, follow the, uh, the instructions for OSCIBot because it's slightly different whether you're on Mac or Linux or on Windows as to where it and its script are supposed to go. And so it means that every time I move the cursor, you can see my time here changes, but that also sends that over to the Mac. So every that's, you'll see the, the cursor's moving. That's every time I move the mouse cursor in the other Reaper. But as soon as I hit play, it sends the play and the time code frame and OSCIBot is then filtering out any further time code messages until I either change it in the mix machine or hit stop so that the Mac with the Dolby Atmos renderer knows where it's at. As soon as it hits play, it's technically in sync, uh, but it's not getting choked by the constant stream of MIDI time code messages, which is why now I can have my Dolby Atmos music panners on the receive end. And because the time of the following Reaper now moves and it plays and stops and goes back with the main machine, that means that any panning automation that I want to do, I can now write in automating on the Mac and it will match up perfectly, frame accurately. And that's awesome. And then of course the uh, LTC time code that's being sent through from uh, Mix Reaper through to the renderer, to the Dolby renderer, that is uh, perfectly accurate. Uh, so everything goes through locked together. It's complicated, but it works. And even though I paid for the Dante thing and the Ravenna thing, I didn't have to. And this all works perfectly solidly with at least 32 channels of audio um, over two machines. And that means that very soon I'm going to be doing some very complicated mixes with uh, one mix machine and one Atmos machine. So some of the caveats now is uh, when I've got a full mix on here, I'll have to kind of tick save as and save an Atmos version of my mix because I have to take everything out of the master send and restructure everything accordingly. And I'll also have to save a new version of this file as well, because any automation of the, uh, the objects that I put in there is going to be specific to that song or to that project. So yeah, I've got to keep everything together and it is a lot more work than stereo. And setting this up is definitely a lot more work than the integrated version in Pro Tools or the integrated version in Logic or on Nuendo. But once it's up and running, and now it is up and running, I'm back to using all the mix reaper functionality that is super fast and super efficient and works the way that I want it to work. So, you know, a bit more work on the, the groundwork than the other solutions, but I've done this without spending silly money on more interfaces. I've done this without spending monthly money on Pro Tools or having to have two Macs because logic, if one's not powerful enough to mix it, or, you know, whatever. Because of course logic is Mac only and the Dolby Atmos Panner is Mac only. So yeah, the, this is probably right now the most affordable solution. And I'm using binaural headphones. Although what you can do with the renderer, let's talk about that quickly, is when you're done, you can, as well as uh, going to export the audio as the ADM, BWF, which is the WAV file that is kind of the, the broadcast output version. I can also export an MP4 with a black video, which I can check on my iPhone. I can check it on my home theater system. I can check it on multi-channel speaker systems that, that they're, you know, just to make sure everything's working as expected. So the, there are ways to check everything out, even if you don't have the 7.1.4 output system. 
I'm hoping to have a 7.1.4 system in my studio at some point soon. And there are talks happening about that. But for now, this is a way to do most of the setup and most of the groundwork and then double check things on a big system. You know, that way I can still do this at two in the morning while family's asleep and then take this to a multi-speaker setup to do the final checks, etc. which is always the way that I work with stereo as well. I do a lot of the groundwork on the cans and then go and check on the monitors for final kind of QC. The one thing also that I did mention briefly earlier and kind of glossed over was this set of channels. This is an extra bonus. This is kind of my master chain, uh, my kind of mix bus in 7.1.2 with uh, you know, a whole setup going. So I've got the send bed tracks here, which is where you're supposed to do exactly what it says. You send 10 channels of of surround bed tracks and then it goes to the god particle by cradle which i really like so the first copy you use as you would um i've got the limiter off uh i've got the output down 8 db so i'm bringing them all down by 8 db so i can work closer to the levels that i would work with a stereo mix uh, but also you know hit the the god particles multi-band stuff uh, as it wants it but keep the levels down at kind of atmos approved kind of levels and so the second third fourth and fifth copies these have all all got audio three and four five and six seven and eight nine and ten because it's a stereo plugin but there's the option of using a side chain so using the very clever routing that Reaper can do, they've all, apart from the first one, got four channels going in, and they've all got the main left and right channel being used as the side chain for any kind of compression or input levels or anything that's going on that might cause any sort of processing behind the scenes to react uh, in a way that all needs to be kept together. I've never heard God Particle pump, but it could be to do with the multiband stuff and it's just keeping it all kind of one left bank, one right bank, and then the center and LFE are just kind of fed off left and right respectively, but I'm not so bothered about the LFE being processed too much because a lot of it will be filtered away anyway. But yes, uh, the routing <laughs> goes, uh, Bedmaster 2 is audio one, and one to four is going to one to four, but then in this, Plugin. And I've turned the percentage down on the center and LFE channels because I don't want them to be quite so processed. But I might find that I do later. I might bring them back to 100%. I don't know yet. But in the plugin pin connector, I flipped the uh, the input and the side chain. So now the audio input is the center and LFE, and the side chain goes from left to right. And on the others, you'll see I've got two separate sends. So I've got one that is sending, like, so for the, the kind of the left and right, slightly rear channels, you know, the ones that sit just behind you, they get audio five and six. And so they get audio five and six going to one and two, but then they also get uh, audio one and two, which is the left and right going to their side chain, which is it's three and four. And so that's repeated across 7, 8, 9, and 10. So there's a lot of sends going on. So it's head-hurtingly complicated, which is why I wanted to do this as a template and only do it once. And so then that's five copies. And then they all go out of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 to renderer to the big chunky block that we were talking about before. Oh, and I forgot to say with the MIDI timecode thing that I'm using a uh, thing called MTC generator, which you can do a second copy of the uh, the timecode generator from Reaper and just change its source properties to send MIDI MTC instead of send audio. But I just happen to uh, like having it uh, with this uh, uh, this plugin that I've I've found, uh, which isn't being sent anywhere. Uh, that's OSC picking that up and then sending that uh, to the appropriate place. 
I think that just about covers it. It's a very long video, I appreciate, uh, but hopefully this is enough for you to get up and running. Like I said, the, uh, the track templates that I've made here are going to be available through the Produce Like a Pro Academy and through Pro Mix Academy if you get the, uh, the Ultimate Reaper Guide course. Uh, I'll try and make sure that's included, but if you're on Produce Like a Pro Academy, then that will be available to you on the forums there. Uh, but you can build your own version like you've seen here too. So hopefully that's been enough for you guys to get working in Reaper with Atmos, because that's what I'm going to do right now. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be doing a live stream or two where I start pulling songs into Atmos and start panning things around and start really having fun. And so I hope you'll join me and see you there. So there we go. It is still highly recommended to check your mixes on a proper like Atmos 7.1.4 system in a properly treated room, all that kind of stuff. But you can at the very least set up the Atmos setup, do a lot of the work with a binaural setup on headphones, or even if you've got like a 5.1 system or something like that, you can do a lot of the work and then kind of do the final checks somewhere else but you know that way you're not paying a daily rate for an atmos room uh, where you would be just kind of wasting time setting everything up in my case that would save me thousands on thousands which is kind of what i'm trying to do if the guys at dolby have seen this video i don't know if they will but if they don't send them this video i really hope they can get that dolby music panner working in Windows soon, if it isn't already and I've missed it somewhere. If there is the Dolby Atmos Panner for Windows, not the renderer, the Panner plugin specifically, let me know in the comments because, again, it might not be out right now, it might be out very soon. Uh, these things are changing all the time, this format is still quite new. So, I'm really hoping that this will be available, the whole thing on Windows at some point, because I tend to use Windows most of the time. I now have the MacBook for portable stuff, but I'm generally a PC guy. So anyway, um, check out the Ultimate Reaper Guide on ProMix Academy, that's down below. Uh, join us on the Discord. Uh, big thanks to all the patrons on Patreon who helped me to do this kind of stuff because I had to pay for, you know, the, the virtual Dante thing, the, the merging Ravenna plugin, all that kind of stuff. Um, £300 plus tax for the uh, Dolby Atmos renderer, which, you know, for me, that's a kind of a, a cost because... Uh, I am hopefully going to be using that a lot in the future. You should see uh, live streams fairly soon of me working out getting songs that I've already mixed in stereo up mixed to Atmos <laughs> with probably varying degrees of sonic success as we work the process out and refine it. But stick around on the channel for that and more Reaper stuff, more bass and guitar stuff, more mixing stuff, and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.